Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this session of the Best Practice Forum on Cybersecurity. This session holds significant importance to us due to its relevance and the valuable output document produced. We are fully aware of your anticipation for this session, so I, uh, before we are starting, I would like to take this opportunity to extend my heartfelt appreciation to all the members of the team who have generously dedicated their time and expertise to the BPF. As a MUG member, we would, say to, we would like to say thanks to those who have participated. This includes our lead expert team, our consultant experts, as well as the dedicated volunteers in, which work, in each working group whose names are acknowledged in the document. Your unwavering commitment and valuable contributions have played a crucial role in the success of this in initiative. The IGF is sincerely grateful for your efforts. That being said, we would like to hand over now the floor to Wim to start the presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Ian Bonana, for these, uh, these opening words, and welcome also on uh, my behalf. I'm uh, Wim de Gezelle. I'm actually I'm working as a consultant with the IGF Secretariat supporting this best practice forum. So I had the pleasure to work with uh, both the MAC members and the team of volunteers uh, and uh, the people that actually did all the work uh, to bring you this, uh, this report. Uh, I was asked to give this short introduction to just um, picture or position uh, the best practice forum to give a little bit of background of what uh, best practice forums actually are and uh, what the BPF on cybersecurity has been doing in the previous years because it is a nice trajectory um, between and the linkage between the work in the previous years and what uh, will be discussed and what has been done uh, this year. So the best practice form is a format is an intersessional activity of the IGF. Uh, that means it is an initiative taken by the MAC uh, that is then run in the months ahead of an IGF meeting, giving the opportunity uh, to people from the community, uh, following the idea of an open and bottom-up uh, model of discussions, uh, to come together and work on a very specific topic. Uh, in this case, cybersecurity. Um, it allows, uh, like I said, uh, different volunteers to work to together, to come together, and that helps that they come, come to an IGF meeting with some preparations, with a draft document uh, that has been prepared, and do some more research and background discussions or preparatory discussions, uh, and that helps to also compile a nice output that is part of the uh, overall outputs of this, uh, this year's IGF meeting. Like I said, there has been a best practice forum that focused on cybersecurity topics for the uh, last couple of years, but every time a different focus or a different, um, uh, different team. However, there is some link between the last uh, three, four years of the BPF cybersecurity as there has been uh, one consistency that they one way or another were linked to the idea of norms and cybersecurity um, cyber security norms. It started actually in uh, 2018, and that sounds, I don't know if it's a long time ago or not long, long ago. Uh, 2018 was a Berlin, uh, Berlin IGF, uh, that is the last IGF before uh, we had the COVID, so I leave it to you if that's a very long time ago or is that fresh in your memory. Uh, but in the year 2018, 18, uh, the best practice forum asked actually the question, what are norms and how are norms developed? Uh, to first clarify the idea of norms, why, how are they, what are they used for, uh, to then better understand what actually are norms in the context of uh, cybersecurity and what are cyber norms. Uh, to then the following year, 
look, how, look into how norms have been or are oper operationalized, and also have a discussion on how important it actually is uh, to involve stakeholders in the development, but also in the oper operationalization of, uh, of norms. Uh, the following year, in 2020, uh, I think was a very interesting, uh, also for the, uh, for the IGF in general, a very interesting experiment because part of the best practice forum was dedicated to look explicitly outside of this arena and outside of the uh, internet-related discussions and look how norms and what kind of norms exist outside uh, cybersecurity and outside the cyber norm. Uh, and we had discussions within the uh, best practice forum on what can be learned from uh, norms, existing norm frameworks in uh, diplomacy, in the nuclear area, uh, of also in the banking and uh, foreign investments, uh, with the question, what can actually be learned uh, when you talk, uh, what f uh, best practices, what practices can be useful when you look at cyber norms. And then two years ago, I think it's very relevant uh, for today's discussion and this year's work, the best practice forum actually wanted to ask the question, okay, we have uh, a body of uh, existing cyber work, uh, cyber norms, but would, what is the value now of those norms? And the team or the group working that year actually did, an did a kind of experiment. They wanted to look at um, cybersecurity incidents, uh, historical incidents, and see if norms that have been created later actually would have made a difference. Um, if they would have been helpful or uh, if that wouldn't have made, uh, wouldn't have made a difference. Uh, so that was an interesting discussion and I think it's directly linked to the discussion we will have uh, today. And last year, uh, also very much uh, linked I think to the, today's discussion, the Best Practice Forum uh, worked on uh, the idea of story banking, looked into different examples of, uh, of story banking and came up with the uh, conclusion that it is important uh, to listen to the experiences of people uh, that have been involved in addressing cybersecurity events uh, or have been impacted by them and that listening to their stories can be very interesting or can, um, can deliver a, 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 rich, uh, a rich information or also a lot of uh, nuance. And that's uh, I think especially the last two years feed directly into or form directly a basis for this year's work, but I will let uh, Clay explain uh, that to you in a minute. I really wanted to give this overview of the work the Best Practice Forum has been doing uh, in the last couple of years because there are documents, each of the years produced an output document, and these documents are still are available on the IGF website. Uh, so if you're interested, I would say please go to the, uh, go to the webpage and you can find there uh, what has been discussed in the, uh, in the previous years. So I will hand over in, in a minute to Clay to start actually today's program and to discuss what has been uh, done this year. Uh, but for, before doing that, I really would like to thank uh, a number of people. First of all, Ian Bonana, and your colleagues, uh, Josephine and Karina, the MAG members, uh, that actually from the MAG said, okay, this is a good idea to have another BPF cybersecurity and supported it uh, at the beginning of the year. So thank you for that. I would like to thank the numerous volunteers and contributors that have been working. They are not all here, but ha that have been working in the uh, previous months uh, or have been involved in the previous months in online discussions and online work already the panel that will be up in a minute, and last but not least, the co-facilitators and lead experts. Uh, Clay, you will see. I don't know if Bart uh, is listening online. He couldn't be here. And Ellie, I don't know if she's already in the room. Yes, she's there. So Ellie also, thank you very much for all your help uh, to make this happen. And then Clay, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Wim, um, especially for giving that broad historical overview. Um, and to continue the thanks, um, your support across all those best practices forums has been so important to help us get
get to where we are and continue to build this multi-stakeholder um, library of documents um, and, and interesting insights into the way cyber and the wider internet governance world fit together. So it's really exciting to see everyone coming together. It's been such a pleasure, um, as Wim mentioned, to work with Wim and Ellie and Bart, um, our MAG liaisons, as well as all the contributors over this last year to see if we could come up with something cool. And I, I think we have. Um, we had a really ambitious approach this year, um, especially because it was a bit of a shortened calendar year for the IGF, and that was to help inform policy and norm discussions by examining a range of incidents from two kind of different angles. One was building on that previous work that the BPF has done, and that's looking at how international norms have or could have played a role in the impact um, and response to incidents. Um, and then we also expanded the scope of our work to include a wider um, perspective on the ecosystem and look beyond the technical impacts, the financial impacts, um, and the business impacts to explore the human side of incidents, um, the flow-on effects that impact individuals, um, victims, responders, as well as societies and communities um, across, across the world. Um, in looking at these, we wanted to focus on a set of key incidents that have happened in the last five or so years, um, and we worked with the BPF to narrow down to five incidents. Um, the first one, the Costa Rica ransomware in 2022, um, the Medibank uh, compromise over in Australia back in 2021. We looked at a range of ransomware affecting national level um, infrastructure or systems um, in the Pacific between 2021 and 2023. Um, the Black Axe criminal network activities, um, roughly between 2022 and 2023, as well as kind of hearkening back to some work we did previously focused on solar winds in 2020. So we really aim to have a wide range of issues from across the world um, and look at a different, um, different types of incidents um, impacting different types of economies. Um, while this report at this, this stage is quite preliminary, um, we have already found some very interesting trends starting to emerge. While they might not be surprising to some of us who are deeply in this space, we think recording this and capturing it in the BPF document is really important to inform, again, that discussion happening at the policy level as well as the normative level. Um, so I'm just gonna share a few of the broad ideas that we um, came up with as a group um, before we jump into a panel and really dig into some of the themes um, that we're gonna look at. Um, so when we're talking about the norms side of things, building on that connection between norms and the incidents, or in fact the lack of connection potentially, um, we have obviously the clear direct associations, things like do not damage critical infrastructure, obviously for incidents that impact critical infrastructure, like in Costa Rica, Vanuatu, Papua New Guinea, um, where government networks were hit, um, including police and fire, um, emergency services, um, hospitals and things like that. Very clear, of course that norm could have had an impact if it could have stopped um, folks from, from uh, undergoing that attack. Um, but of course, there are also broader common themes um, that even if they don't consciously involve the norms, um, the impact or response captures that spirit of the norm or embodies that spirit of the norm. Um, one of the clearest is, of course, respect for human rights. Um, again, the access to critical services um, and the challenge of accessing critical services in the case of these wider attacks is um, obviously quite concerning, um, but also many involve data exfiltration, um, which creates clear privacy and even safety concerns um, in the real world. Um, there are interesting angles around responses to requests for assistance in inter international state cooperation on security, um, particularly in some of the instances in the Pacific as well as Costa Rica. The ability to call on partners, both government as well as private sector, was critical um, to getting back online and getting, getting the country going again. Um, there's cooperation to stop crime and terrorism, most clearly uh, in the Black Axe um, case, as well as issues around reporting ICT vulnerabilities as seen with solar winds um, and in other cases. One of the most interesting um, findings that we found, um, which again is not so surprising, but is very important because this space has become the core of many of our international discussions, is around cyber capacity building. Um, not only has these incidents spurred more investment, more awareness, especially amongst decision makers, and more activity in cyber capacity building, there are a lot of signs where previous capacity building activities came into play and helped with the response efforts. 
whether it's the establishment of networks of trust and information sharing that were called into play, or whether it's trainings that have previously happened, allowing and facilitating local teams to be able to respond to some of these incidents. So a lot of common themes at the normative level, um, but also we saw some interesting impacts at that human level, which is the new angle that we explored this year. Um, again, some obvious ones, impact on human services, uh, whether it's health services, salaries being, being impacted, or in the case of Fiji with the COVID-19 um, app being impacted uh, during the GovNet attack, um, there's the direct impact on human services there. Again, the privacy and data concerns, um, Medibank is the clearest example on that one. Um, but one of the more interesting things is kind of the amplification of ex existing contextual dynamics. It's a bit of a mouthful, um, and it might be <laughs> a bit confusing, um, but this is the case where an incident actually helped amplify other things that were happening in society at the time. So the Fiji case, for example, involving the COVID-19 application, it fed into a lot of the misinformation and concern happening around the COVID-19 vaccine. So just because these things happened at the same time, it amplified that local context. Um, we saw a similar thing in Samoa, where the ransomware attack against government, while relatively small compared to some of the other incidents, happened immediately after an election. Um, that was slightly contentious. Um, therefore, it fed into a lot of rumors and speculation around the previous government, the current government, and things like that. So it's, a, it's, it's very important to look at and think about these flow-on, second, third-order impacts across society. And of course, um, the positive side, those notable policy and capacity building responses, again, whether it's cybercrime agreements, um, the Bowie and Langatoy declarations in the Pacific, the cyber safety um, response board in the US, um, and things like that coming across. Of course, we'll look into all these kind of dynamics as we go into the panel. So I just want to close there um, by sharing that the draft is online, but it is still an open draft. This is a BPF. This is about getting everyone involved and capturing everything from the discussion, including our panel discussion and what's happening here at the IGF. So if you're interested, there's still time to get involved. Please let us know. Um, let's make this document great and also hopefully work into the future with support of our MAG colleagues to do some more BPF work. Um, so at this stage, uh, let's dive into these concepts. I'd like to welcome the panel onto the stage. Thanks for joining me, guys. Um, I'll introduce everyone as they start speaking. Um, but for this panel, um, I know we're in a very big, impressive, formal room, but we're going to try and make it a little bit more conversational and relaxed. Feel, feel free to come forward. Um, we really want you guys to get involved as well. We have mics up here at the front. Um, so as we open up the conversation, um, re really want to hear your questions, but also some of your thoughts, perspectives, and experiences. Um, each of our panelists will have a quick two to five minutes just to get the ideas flowing, um, and then we'll jump into kind of a conversation with all of you and, and see if we can come up with some interesting things. Um, our first speaker has been doing really amazing work um, bringing those incident experiences into the high-level discussions around norms um, and capacity building and um, international policy um, around the OEWG. So I'd like to start off with Louise. Tell us what you've been doing. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Louise Marie Urell. I am a research fellow at the Royal United Services Institute, which is a think tank focusing on security and defense based in London. I'm over at their cyber program. And, um, you know, as a person that has been involved in the BPF in previous years and has been following the work that the BPF has done, I think, you know, there's some core elements here, right? When we think about the normative dimension as Clay and Wim um, alluded to before. So I think there is the understanding of, you know, the normative dimension being the UN norms. Uh, there's the normative dimension of other stakeholders and what they propose. So first having, for example, you know, principles or an understanding of what ethics means in terms of responding to, to particular incidents. Um, and I think there is a fundamental question of how do we learn from these incidents? Um, and I think sometimes we're having these conversations in silos, and that is the value of the BPF in bridging, let's say, the technical community and um, 
the more diplomatic environment, right? And that's something that we've been doing over at RUSI. Um, we're coordinating a project on responsible cyber behavior. And part of that project is really trying to understand how countries from different regions actually kind of see responsibility in practice. And, um, and one of the things that we did um, in July is that we organized a side event during the open-ended working group. And we focused on looking at ransomware um, and how, how did different countries respond to ransomware incidents. I think that is a particular type of threat, right, that speaks across the development spectrum. Uh, so many countries, small island countries, developing countries, developed countries, all of them can relate in one way or another. And I think that's very powerful in bridging the conversation also at the international level. Um, so as I said, you know, we, we did organize the site event and it was an, um, was co-sponsored by, co-organized with Estonian MFA, but also co-sponsored by Vanuatu and Costa Rica. And over there, we're really focusing on three points. So sharing and reflecting on lessons learned from responding and recovering from those incidents and bringing really the, the experience of Costa Rica and Vanuatu, how these experiences can inform awareness and enhancing response, and how this threat should be reflected in the context of the OWG. So up until July, ransomware hadn't been you know, ha has been discussed a lot, but it hadn't been actually included in the report. Um, and there are different sections to the OEWG's report, right? Um, you do have emerging threats, norms, international law, um, confidence building measures, and among other kind of dimensions of the report. And the question is, what happens and what is the logic of countries actually including ransomware as an international peace and security issue? And that is what we uh, discussed there. Um, to understand, you know, what distinguishes a ransomware incident from a criminal dimension, right, to a national security or international security dimension. And by discussing and bringing these examples, and we, have o we had over 30 governments around the table, it was a small discussion closed so that we could, you know, really get to the nitty gritty of those um, experiences in other countries as well, but also other stakeholders in the room. So the things that we, we found, and we were looking at two questions, one is the distinction between, you know, what's the international peace and security threshold from ransomware incidents, and the second bit was how can we think about the implementation on the norms for requests for assistance, um, which is one of the norms agreed by member states in 2015 within the context of the, um, the group of governmental experts. So how can we talk about, you know, how do they perceive that uh, request for assistance in the context of ransomware? Uh, so for the international peace and security, and I'll close in just like a, a minute, we identified a couple of criteria that different states brought to the table. So the first one is really, you know, when we think about ransomware incidents as an illustration of that threshold, we're looking at scale, scope, and speed. And it might feel like very obvious to think about that, but when, but again, when we're thinking about what does it mean to distinguish between criminal approaches, and that means, you know, law enforcement being there, and then, you know, going to national security, you know, so what's the distinction? So scale, scope, and speed, and as you know, like 2022, Costa Rica had more than 20 ministries going offline. In the case of Vanuatu, there was the parliament, police, PM's office, schools, and hospitals being attacked, uh, affected actually f because of the incident. So you see that in a very concrete way. Um, the second element, and we could talk about Tonga and others as well, but the second criteria is really thinking about impact. Um, and when thinking about the experiences that Costa Rica and Vanuatu brought to the table during the discussion, they really talked about the economic impact. I think developing countries are disproportionately impacted by ransomware incidents, right? It's not as if they can recover as quickly or they can, you know, um, respond, if, you know, very quickly to that in economic terms. So that could lead to political instability. So there are other risks that derive from that particular kind of incident. So Costa Rica talked about how the ask of Conti was from 10 to 20 million but the actual cost for them was between 35 to 60 million, right? So the logic of not paying the ransom is fine, but when you look at you know, how these countries that sometimes have parts of their GPD or you know, parts of their budget being kind of taken off because of this incident, you really need to think about other potential trickle-down risks. So 
third uh, motivation, right? I mean, what's the motivation of these groups in actually targeting developing countries more specifically? So Costa Rica, you had um, Conti actually saying that they wanted to take down the government, that they had like an interest in that sense. And when it came to Vanuatu, it's really an intention to explore, to exfiltrate, um, and to explore other sectors, so kind of move laterally, not within the system, but you know, across the government and other sectors. Fourth is funding. I mean, where do these, where do these like ransomware groups, yeah, take their their you know their financing? Are they sponsored by states? Are they affiliated with different member states? And that is something that came up in the conversation. And finally, just to close off because I know we're on time, um, is also reserving the right not to. D to define that international peace and security threshold. That is a prerogative, of course, of, uh, of states um, in that context, but I think it's something to reflect, right? Not all states will be interested in necessarily saying that a ransomware is a national security incident until they face it. Um, and that was a clear distinction that we saw in the room, um, some of them recognizing that it is important, but then saying, since we're, we haven't faced it as much as we would have expected, that's not necessarily the priority in terms of our risk management nationally. Um, so I'll just leave it at there, and we can explore a little bit more the, the assistance part, but um, that is more or less what came up in the room. Excellent. Thanks so much, Louise. Um, it's really great to see that those lessons were taken to the OEWG, and the governments were involved and really wanted to learn how the norms as well as the reality of incidents can take place. Um, next, we're going to dive even deeper into the UN and hear from our speaker who's part of the UN system, but interestingly, not part of the first committee where a lot of these discussions are happening, but more from a technical perspective as the CIO. Um, so Dino, um, let's, let's hear what's going on over there. Thank you very much, Clean. So my name is Dino DeLatro. I'm the Chief Information Officer of the United Nations Joint Staff Pension Fund. I've been with the United Nations for over 22 years. A large part of my career, the United Nations, it has been in internal auditing. For many years, I was the chief IT auditor of the UN. I also spent three years in uh, cybersecurity. And since 2017, I've been appointed CIO of the UN Pension Fund. So in the last two years, I also joined the MAG, the multi-stakeholder advisory group of the IGF, representing the international organization, specifically my organization. And because of my background within the MAG, I started to follow the uh, work that has been done, the excellent work, I should say, that has been done by my colleagues in the Best Practice Forum on Cybersecurity. And I was invited to participate. So it's in the last year, I participated and uh, I was able to provide my humble input. So the conversation here is about two aspects. One is, what is the impact on the communities, on the individual, on the citizens, on the groups? And the second aspect is on what is the response of government and how the policies, how the responses of this government are influenced by what? So I took a, a particular angle, if you will, and of course I'm biased because of my background as, a, as an auditor, and I propose to include in the set of criteria also the role played by the Supreme National Audit Institution. So in those cases that have been analyzed, that have been included in the scope of this study, you will see that there are cases that have been specifically identified by region and by country. So I specifically, I was given the opportunity to collaborate on the analysis of the solar wind and specifically look at what happened, for example, in the United States or in Europe. And so by looking, for example, at the response and at the work done by the audit institution of the United States, which is GAO, the Government Accountability Organization, we can start to appreciate if, where, and how the response of a government can be influenced when the government indeed follows the recommendation of its supreme audit institution, also by the auditors. And immediately after, here the conversation is, 
what did the auditor say and how did they reach that conclusion? Because in order to issue a recommendation, the auditor needs to refer to a set of standards to assess the impact, for example, of a cybersecurity event and incident. And accordingly, elaborate and develop a meaningful and as in the profession is usually said, implementable recommendation, not an abstract recommendation. So I try to bring this perspective, this point of view, because this is indeed the challenge that in many cases I lived in within the United Nations, going back to your question. So I had the privilege and honor to sit on both sides of the desk as an IT auditor, analyzing, auditing cybersecurity incidents that uh, unfortunately occur also within the United Nations because actually the United Nations is often a target of attacks. As well as thanks to 2017, on the side of management as a CIO and understand beyond the technicalities of an issue, of an incident and the corresponding mitigating control, what are the guiding principles? Are we following recommendations that are rooted in the, for example, norms of responsible behavior in cybersecurity that the UN itself has issued? So I think the question really is at the two level. One at the level of principles and best practices and one at the level of the operational and practical recommendation. So this is the question and the challenge that I always try to, to, to address and to, to, to grasp. And I'm concluding here. I see that, for example, at the level of the norm, at the level of the principle, we do have somehow a body of principle that are internationally shared. As I mentioned, there are the UN norms of responsible behavior. There are other think tanks, other non-for-profit organizations, for example, that have been referenced in the study itself the, um, the Global Commission on the Stability of Cybersecurity and its eight principle. So there is a convergence, there is a shared uh, understanding and a shared agreement on that. But my question is, what about the audit profession? Is there, for example, at the level of an INTOSAI, which is an acronym that stands for International Organization of Supreme Audit Institution, that brings all the audit, supreme audit institution of the various government together. Is there an agreement on how to assess and evaluate the impact? So I think this is maybe uh, could be an interesting area for further investigation and analysis. Thank you. Thanks so much. Very pro pro um, provocative, thought-provoking um, questions there. Um, and I think some of the panelists might have some interesting responses as well as folks from the room. Um, so let's hang on to that uh, for when we open up to the discussion. Um, next, we're going to shift a little bit more to start um, on that human level impact. Um, we'll have a great present presentation from Susan um, from Vanuatu and the GFC Pacific Hub, um, who both has the privilege of sharing the Pacific view, but also her own view, um, having been in Vanuatu during the, the ransomware incident. Thank you so much uh, for this uh, opportunity to join the panelists. Um, yes, um, as uh, mentioned earlier by the other panelists, um, unfortunately, r um, cyber incidents is something that is actually happening uh, around the world and uh, regionally uh, in the Pacific. Uh, this is one of the things that we are quite more concerned on uh, as it is uh, making headlines. Uh, and um, in the impacts when it comes to this cyber incidents uh, from the Vanuatu uh, point of view, it was a devastating um, experience as we see uh, that uh, the systems are down and not only that, but the impacts run further as uh, more than the impacts are as measured only in the impacts when it comes to technological impacts. Uh, and one of the things we're seeing is human beings are also impacted also in this uh, unfortunate um, situation. And um, 
And uh, through these uh, types of uh, incidents, uh, it, it forces countries, tiny countries, island countries like Vanuatu to, to, to join efforts with other neighboring countries uh, and, and to foster a more um, resilient uh, approach going forward uh, to, to be more resilient when it comes to cybersecurity um, incidents and, and response. And, and, uh, it's very uh, interesting to see that uh, now the human impact of these incidents are also uh, taking uh, a, a spotlight uh, and it's very encouraging as, as uh, human beings, uh, uh, people who also uh, impacted uh, uh, when it comes to these types of incidents and, and uh, we hope uh, these types of discussions uh, also help uh, us as governments, as organizations, as companies also take into consideration the human impact of any cybersecurity incidents. So thank you for that. Thanks, Susan. Um, next, we'll hear from Kivuva with Kick the Net, um, who's been doing a lot of interesting work with uh, civil society over in Kenya. Okay, thank you for... Thank you for the introduction. So my name is Mwendwa Kivuva from Kiktanet, which is a multi-stakeholder think tank that does policy advocacy, multi-stakeholder convening, capacity building, and research. Within Kiktanet, we have a CyberNorm project that we have been running since the year 2018. And in this project, we convene stakeholders, and the stakeholders involve governments and especially the, the security organs, the judiciary, but we also involve the telecom service providers and other industrial leaders to come and discuss cyber security issues and challenges that are faced. And the purpose and objective of this uh, convening is information sharing, confidence building between the stakeholders, building capacity of participants, identifying strategies and actions that should be taken uh, when there is any breach and understanding the emerging issues in the region, in the country, and also in the region at large. And we have, we have had several outcomes uh, from those meetings, and some of them have actually gone into, and gone into law, and have been there are some regulations that have come from from those incidences. And also we participate at the something we call NC4 in Kenya, which is Computer and Cyber Crime Coordination Committee, which is a, co a collaboration to create conducive regulations uh, in Kenya uh, to ensure that uh, cyber, cyber incidents are actually handled. We've had challenges, uh, cyber challenges, for example, this year, there was a serious DDoS attack that was done by an organization called Anonymous Sudan. Uh, Anonymous Sudan, I think uh, they have attacked even some st uh, state department uh, organs in US. So uh, they, they managed to, to do a serious DDoS attack, a denial, denial of service attack on several key installations including bringing down M-Pesa. So M-Pesa was down for like a day or some hours. And M-Pesa is a critical infrastructure in Kenya because most payments are done using the mobile payment system. So you can imagine we go to a petrol station, you want to fuel your car, and the system is not working. You are in a hotel, you have ordered a meal, you want to pay for your meal, but you cannot make the payment you want to make a transaction maybe to pay school fees for your child or pay for a bus and it's not working. So that was a serious breach. And they also managed to do the DDoS attack on government infrastructure, especially uh, a service called Huduma in Kenya. That service provides citizen services like uh, renewal of passports, applications, uh, the application for birth certificates, and also electronic visa. So citizens, who, uh, travelers who are coming to Kenya could not actually be able to apply for electronic visas because the system was down. 
And this DDoS was coordinated through botnets. You know, botnets are just devices that have been taken over, zombie devices. And the, the anonymous Sudan guys are also able to buy more cloud infrastructure so that they can be able to attack a single server. And you know, even, even advanced uh, countries and advanced corporations are not able to handle DDoS attacks effectively. Because what, actually one of the top five uh, companies in the world had their cloud servers taken down by this particular organization. So it's a big challenge that, of course, something like these best practice forums can be able to handle to see that how better coordination, especially between security organs, Interpol, to be able to bring these bad actors to book. Thank you. Cool. Yeah, thank you so much for that, that insight from Kenya um, and that, that human impact again from uh, the, the loss of these services um, during, during the incidents. Um, I, I, I kind of want to turn the first question to Dino, actually. You asked the, the, the question about how to assess and evaluate the impact um, from that normative perspective, but hearing especially from Susan um, in Kivuva, is there a way that auditors are looking at that human impact now, or do you have any suggestions or ideas on how that human side can also be integrated into the auditing and consideration of the norms, but also cybersecurity practices? So, in terms of, if you will, basic terms of reference that guide, in general, the ICT profession, but also the IT auditing profession, of course, at the foundation, there is a triad, people, process, and technologies. And in preparing for an audit, we are asked as auditor to first and foremost conduct an audit risk assessment. Because fundamentally, given the broad scope of area that can or should be audited, it's humanly impossible to have an adequate number of resources to cover the whole spectrum. And therefore, the term and the principle that it's used is that in planning audits, what the audit profession within the UN does, it, it approach the function with risk-based auditing. So during the conduct of, of the risk analysis, there is an evaluation not only of the technical aspect of an area, not only an evaluation, the assessment of the budgetary amount associated, for example, with an office or with a function or with an organization, but definitely one of the guiding principles is the asset. What is the asset that it is or could be impacted by, for example, in the area of cybersecurity by an hacking attack. And we all agree that the most important asset is the human being. The most important asset for the organization is the staff member and those that the United Nations serves. So I would say positively that there is that appreciation and there is definitely that consideration that puts the human being at the center of the process. So it's not just an acronym, but there is also a sequence of priority where you look first at the people, then on the process, and ultimately and finally at the technology as a mean to an end. Thank you. Excellent, it's really good to hear that 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 human angle is considered already, um, and hopefully it can be considered more also in the, in the policy space and things like that. One thing you mentioned was, with the broad scope of the issue, it's imp impossible to consider everything. Um, but if it's impossible to consider everything, it's even more impossible to secure everything and respond to everything. Um, so oftentimes it takes partners. Um, so I kind of want to ask you the next question, Louise, um, that you mentioned about the, sorry, the, um, the, requests for assistance from international partners, and obviously that took place in the incidents that you guys were looking at. Um, can you explore that kind of dynamic a little bit more as well? Yes, absolutely, and I think, again, going back to the discussion on 
how do we connect the norm that have been the norms that have been agreed at the international level with like the practice, right? I think there's a lot of discussion since 2015 because there's the norm on like whenever there's a particular incident of large scale that is of national concern that another state can either request or another country like let's say a supporting country can um, come and and provide assistance. And what we've seen in the past year, honestly, um, Clay, is an ev evolution of the discussion of um, requests for assistance, right? And I think it relates a lot to CCB, to cyber capacity building. I was talking about that in a different panel, but I'm just going to bring it here. I think we need to break down the different dimensions of assistance. Um, so the first one being, you know, that kind of programs that really develop skills that, you know, help develop a more or let's say resiliency um, in different countries. I think there is one that's specific to crisis response, right? So whenever there's like Costa Rica, you had different governments supporting Costa Rica coming and still until today kind of providing support in terms of Vanuatu as well. You know, you had the Australians that have been kind of like collaborating a lot, but you do have a history there of like multiple engagements that lead to that trust building element between governments and then providing assistance. So it's not as if, you know, a country goes through a particular kind of like large scale incident, normally ransomware as we've been uh, discussing, and then, you know, country X comes in. So there needs to be that rapport, there needs to be that trust. So there are a couple of elements that we got from the discussion. So as I said, the second part of our our, our, let's say, workshop with different um, member states and also with stakeholders was really to look at, you know, what does it mean to talk about requests for assistance? So what we saw was that assistance varies a core, a, in addition, you know, varies depending on severity, on its type, on its context. When I mentioned, you know, the crises, the conflict element, and let's say your usual uh, skills building and resilience, they're very different types of contexts, right, when you actually need to provide assistance. So the first element that states um, kind of highlighted in that particular environment was that there needs to be, you know, they need to ensure that governments are aware of the criticality of incident. And I think that's something that's kind of like homework. It's inside the government that's going through the crisis most of the times, right? It's like, it's convincing that, you know, domestically, most of the, let's say, cybersecurity professionals in the policy angle and also on the technical side are overstretched. So they need to go and knock on different doors and say, you know, this is a relevant incident. We're not being able to access our systems because of that. And I think the powerful element of ransomware incidents, it's that it, it makes it, you know, it, it denies access to a particular kind of service. So it's easier to see the impact of that particular incident immediately. Um, but still, there's, there's a lot of convincing, and we heard a lot of that during the discussion. Um, also, it's about you know assembling and coordinating internally. So countries that might not have had the opportunity to do that, sometimes you do have a national cert. But at the other end, you know, is your cert well integrated into, let's say, your broader policy response? So I think these are opportunities where you know, there needs to be a lot of coordination. The second element on, you know, thinking about the application of this norm for requests for assistance is really, you know, strengthening coordination among and within states providing assistance. So we talked a lot yesterday and um, two days before about this, but it's really avoiding duplication of efforts. And one thing that we heard from different Pacific Island countries is there normally is, and others as well, that there's normally a lot of offers of trainings uh, with regards to certs and to skills building. But if there are different countries providing the same kind of assistance, um, you know, what's the added value? What's the sustainability of those kinds of efforts? And there was a lot of discussion around that. And, um, and I think we are at the stage, given the, be it the, the Russo-Ukrainian war, be it the context of, you know, different conflicts and how the cyber dimension has been included in that, we're seeing a test of different mechanisms trying to respond and provide assistance in a more agile way. But there's still lots of things that we need to explore, the role of the private sector in all of this. And finally, um, the point that they raised was really to develop capacity for proactive monitoring and response. So we also had Montenegro in the room. And uh, the representative from Montenegro gave a really good example that 
In his case, he was the only POC across government. Um, so he had to kind of assemble all the information to kind of you know, uh, send it across. So, but there is a very opportunistic thing, which in a positive way is that they actually, after the incident, they had political momentum to develop their national cybersecurity agency and also to develop their new national cybersecurity strategy. So I think there are things that we can learn from this process, both in terms of what kinds of mechanisms do we need, what are the contexts that we're applying these requests for assistance? Do we need specific mechanisms depending on, you know, which, you know, if it's just your usual, let's say, resilience building or crisis response? And I think finally, it's really being realistic about the bureaucracy of government and how can the private sector and other stakeholders support in all of that. Thanks, Louise. Um, I kind of want to jump over to Susan next, actually, because. We've seen a lot of each other the last few weeks, um, but most recently we were at the P4C um, conference in Fiji looking at capacity building, um, and it kind of touches on what Louise just said. We discussed all the elements of what's happening, what's being duplicated, how to coordinate, and how to do better. Um, so I just kind of wanted to get your thoughts, um, Susan, on kind of the best ways for the Pacific as a region, considering all the incidents that have happened and the discussions over the last, last couple of weeks, to kind of perform prepare for those future incidents, build those relationships with partners um, across the Pacific, but also globally, um, to, to be able to respond to those kind of uh, ransomware incidents. Yes, thank you so much uh, for this question. Um, yes, um, uh, there are several points that have been touched, and one of them is the, the cooperation uh, that has been um, embraced uh, regionally. And, and I think I'd like to highlight this also uh, a little bit more. You know, in the Pacific uh, region, we have different country nations, and these nations ha are in different parts when, it, parts when it comes to their journey on cybersecurity. There's some of them that are more advanced in their journey in cybersecurity, and they're taking advanced steps. There's some of them that are not so in this advanced level when they come to work in the cybersecurity space. Uh, but at the same time, there are some of them that are new in that space of cybersecurity, and hence they are taking baby steps in that journey. So um, when it comes to uh, effectively addressing those uh, cybersecurity incidents, the power of collaboration and cooperation in a region, as a, uh, one of our panelists mentioned, Australia is assisting our, our tiny island nation, which we were so, we were so blessed to, to have this assistance. Uh, when it comes to addressing it, this collaboration helps uh, this tiny island nation address these cyber uh, incidents more effectively and, and more efficiently. And this is one of the main things I would like to highlight uh, for the, as a region. Uh, it's very important uh, to have strategic uh, collaboration and cooperation among regions as it uh, fosters this uh, ability to effectively address uh, cyber security. And, and last uh, couple of weeks, so we have uh, the Paxon uh, annual meeting in Vanuatu, and also we have the first uh, symposium also in Vanuatu, and then followed by the P4C in Fiji. And these are some of the main things, uh, some of the main platforms that helps this collaboration and strengthen uh, this relationship among the countries, while at the same time uh, being mindful of the fact that all of these countries in the region share uh, many, many same values, and that is very, very important uh, when it comes to addressing these types of things uh, in regards to trust. Thanks, Susan. I'm really glad you kind of outlined the range of events that we were just at. So P4C was very much about capacity building and bringing in resources and working together as a wider region and globally. Paxon is actually a regional network of incident response, Pacific to Pacific assistance. Um, and of course, with FIRST, we were able to bring in the private sector, communities of practice, and the broader stakeholder group um, to explore and build those networks of assistance as well. Um, so it's very important to remember that your partners that you can turn to aren't just interstate, but also within your region, but also within your society. And that's something I kind of want to touch on within the Kenyan context. We had an interesting discussion about how Kenya's CERT looks and engages with the multi-stakeholder community. So I was wondering if you could share a little bit about that, but also how the involvement of civil society in the work with Kenya, sir, has kind of created better results. Okay, thank you for that. 
So Kiktanet belongs to the Kenya SAT. We are actually members of the SAT. We, re we represent the civil SAT interests in the, in the SAT. And one of the big things that we can do is actually capacity building. From, from where we sit, social engineering is very big, is a big threat, especially in our country. And the reason is everybody has a, a banking account on their phone through mobile money banking. And even the middle class or those well to do have mobile apps connected to their banks or they do internet banking. So it's very easy to do social engineering on like everybody across the entire spectrum of the population because everybody, uh, there's something you can get from them. So we've seen very vulnerable people, probably people who are not well informed or educated, uh, being wiped clean by criminals. So they just get a call, hi, I'm so and so, I'm calling from the bank and your account is about to be closed, please send me this information so that we can update your account details or else your account will be closed by the bank and you will lose all your money. So they send the, either it's a two-factor authentication code that is sent to their device or things like that and every, the, all their money is wiped out from the account. So that is very common and sometimes it's, it's, it's even inside a, inside a uh, information, maybe that somebody in a telecommunication company in the bank is working with criminals. So we saw the need to do citizen cyber hygiene. So within, within that, we created very simple messaging using posters, flyers, uh, simple cartoons, uh, comic strips, which we distributed through different platforms. Most of them were social media platforms, but we also used television and radio, especially vernacular radio, which has a wider reach, reach for the marginalized. And this one we targeted women, farmers, because there is a big farming community, and the farmers are actually businessmen because they sell their produce to the market. And we took this key simple messaging to, uh, to, to, the, to, to, to the ground. And we came with actually one acronym called STIC, just S-T-I-C-K, meaning uh, when you see anything, you have to stop, think, and check before, before you act. And this was a very successful campaign, citizen cyber hygiene campaign, which had a reach of around, from our analysis, we, we reached around three million beneficiaries directly. And that was achieved by also training, training of trainers. So we had like 140 tra uh, trainers that we trained so that they can be able to take this information to the village level. And so one of the big things that civil society can play is actually participate in capacity building. And when they work closely with the SATs, they are able to know what are the threats that are there and what are the intervention or what are the measures that can be taken to solve those threats? Yeah. Cool, it's, it's, it's excellent to see that in practice um, and certainly something that a lot of the rest of the community can learn from. Um, at this point, I'd really like to involve all of you. Again, best practices forums are all about everyone getting involved across the community. Um, so please feel free. We have a microphone at the end of each aisle. Um, just line up if you guys want to ask a question or also if you want to share a similar experience of incidents occurring in your country or some of the work that you've done within the UNGG, OEWG, Program of Action um, type space where the norms and incidents are coming together. Um, so does anyone have an initial question? I think we have one person coming up. No, just, just taking a seat. Um, so, so think of things, please come up. Uh, here we go. Uh, pl please introduce yourself as well before uh, asking. Hi, good morning. Francisco Libardia, diplomat from Panama. Um, my question is directed to the day after a cyber incident. Uh, during my journey here in the IGF, well, I have heard that international law is applicable to the cyberspace, but my question is how can we enforce international law after a cyber incident, one? And my second question is, in the case of Costa Rica and Vanuaru, what are the legal mechanisms that they have 
in order to hold accountable the cyber attackers and, of course, claim compensation after a cyber incident. Because I remember in the past, for instance, before the UNCLOS, the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, there was no forum or not legal mechanism or legal venue to claim damages or to claim, you know, when your ship was uh, seized by any other country. But after the UNCLOS, we have ITLOS today that you can go to ITLOS and hold accountable any other country or the ones that uh, affect your ships. So I would like your thoughts or your experiences or what does developing nations as Costa Rica and Vanuatu have in order to hold accountable cyber attackers and to claim compensation after a cyber incident? All right, we're starting off with a hard one. Does any, <laughs> anyone want to take a first crack at it? Louise? Yes, um, thank you very much for that question. Definitely not easy questions. Um, so in terms of your first question on how to enforce international law, I think there are lots of um, open-endedness, uh, you know, uh, in, in, with regards to that. I think there's a, there's a lot of interpretation and understanding of how different states see the applicability of international law in cyberspace before we arrive to that effective kind of answer. Uh, but I think we're progressing because many states and in the region, you have Brazil and you have Costa Rica being countries that already published their views. So I think that's a good step and a positive step. Uh, so I think Costa Rica definitely we could say that the fact that Costa Rica published their views on international law is one of the outcomes of that thinking and political prioritization. Um, and uh, so, but one of the things that we discussed during the, the, the event that I mentioned, the workshop, and that stays raised was it's not all, you know, there's still an open-ended question about when it comes to ransomware incidents, and that is applicable to other large-scale incidents, right? When does it constitute a breach of sovereignty, right? If an incident does constitute that. And I think we still don't have an interpretation of how different states actually see this. Some are more strict about what does it mean to, you know, what does it mean to infringe or breach sovereignty. France, for example, has a very narrow interpretation. Brazil has another interpretation, uh, but I think as many as countries publish their views, it's going to be clear on what are the expectations on enforcement, then to reach a more concrete conversation of what that means, like, and how do we find common ground. Um, and to your second question on how to hold accountable attackers, I think there are two dimensions to that. I think there's definitely a di domestic dimension, and I think countries already have things in their toolbox to respond. So, you know, some countries um, use sanctions to call out bad behavior. Um, some do joint political attribution. But is that the case for most of the countries? I wonder whether there is this political interest of actually calling out bad behavior in that sense. I think from a criminal perspective, of course, law enforcement has done a lot in terms of integrated networks, Interpol, Ameripol, and others kind of trying to um, share information and respond from, let's say, a crime-based level. But at the international peace and security, I think it's still quite challenging, um, not to say that, that, that there's no progress. But the second dimension that I, that I wanted to talk about is the international one. So the new agenda for peace published just recently at the UN does talk about a, mechanisms for, a mechanism for accountability internationally. What does that mean going forward? I think there's lots to discuss, um, but I think we do have a lot already in terms of experiences that have been shared within the OEWG, and us as a research community and other stakeholders have been trying to facilitate more of that dialogue with states to understand what the practice lies and how do they see that. So hopefully that provides some food for thought. If I can just add one additional comment. Uh, in addition to the jurisdictional layer and domain. And I speak for direct experience. This is a, is a public event. The pension fund a few years ago was attacked by ransomware. We made it public and of course we had to engage and we engaged uh, with the hosting country, with the FBI specifically in my case. And at the operational level, the technical level, one other open-ended question is the question of attribution. Before being able to raise the issue in front of the jurisdictional level, there is a need to observe the rule of evidence and being able to demonstrate who, what, when, and how. 
And that's, I mean, going back to what I was saying before, there is the need also at the technical level to have that body of generally accepted principle that to recognize the forensic process that goes into collecting that evidence and submitting it to the jurisdictional uh, bodies. Thank you. So, so you are talking about the general link between the crime and the possible author. Exactly. And uh, recapping your response, so you are talking about like to advance moving toward a path of customary international law because if you are sharing your view, it's a state practice, but we don't have opinion juris right now. Precisely, and I think that, that, that you know, if countries do publish more of their views on international law, that will help with establishing that body uh, for sure. Uh, but I think we're at the stage where you know some will only have political. So over at the Americas, right? I mean, the OAS has you know convened you know the Inter-American Judicial Committee, and countries have been consulted on their views, and I think there's still a lot of in-house efforts to raise the political priority of those kinds of discussions so that you know states feel as if they can publish within their regional bodies, within the UN. So I think there are lots of layers that can be explored and there's a lot of progress already kind of like happening in Latin America. So that's potentially something, um, yeah, a positive note um, in going forward, right? But I think there's, there's a lot to, to achieve still. Thank you. Uh, I also like to just uh, give a little bit food for thought uh, on that. Um, yes, it is quite hard to get every country to agree on, you know, all this international law going uh, forward as it's a reality of what is actually happening. But one of the things that we could consider is to have legal frameworks on a regional level, have countries agree on that as a benchmark, and then we move forward. Perhaps it will be more practical to have the countries in your region have a benchmark when it comes to the, the legal frameworks and how to hold uh, bad players accountable for their actions and etc. Uh, that is more practical as compared to um, trying to get 80 countries to agree on one thing. So yeah, just food for thought. Thank you. Interesting your suggestion about regional mechanisms. Interesting. Thank Excellent. Thank you so much for the question. Please. Thank you very much. I'm Larissa Calza from the Cyber Division of the Brazilian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. I would like to thank all the panelists for their very good presentations. So one question I would have building up from what my colleague just mentioned on the issue of possible remedies, countermeasures, sanctions. Um, one of the panelists mentioned the, the importance of building up forensic evidence to, to find out the origins of these attacks. But how do we deal from a more international peace and security standpoint with the fact that many times countries amass that evidence but are unwilling to actually publish it while still wanting to put some sort of countermeasures in place? And on another note, I would also like to ask your views on the possible effectiveness of some initiatives that are currently going on on trying to establish political declarations on the non-payment of ransomware. How effective can they be? How enforceable can they be? Thank you. Very, another very good question. And to, I'm not sure whether I do have an answer. I can just uh, speak for experience here. And again, uh, looking both the experience has auditor and ODT here. And how, the way I see it is that here you need both a top-down approach and a bottom-up approach. Definitely the resolution, the treaty, the agreement are extremely important to create a level of consensus at the, at the high level. But at the same time, there is the need for a bottom-up approach where the practitioners, those who are responsible for the day-to-day -day operation, agree on a set of standards and technical procedure that will allow them to at least be consistent and to agree also on a level of disclosure that allows the prompt information about an attack. So there is unfortunately, as I think you alluded to implicitly in your comments and observation, a resistance in disclosing because 
there is fear, there are responsibility, there's accountability. And so what we are trying, I think the community is still trying to resolve is to how to find the right balance between being responsible in sharing, but at the same time being responsible in not oversharing, in not providing too many details that will, if you will, increase the negative impact of one, that kind of event. So at the technical level, I don't want to go into many technicalities, but for example, there are now technologies that start to allow what are called the zero knowledge proof. They start allowing to the ability to provide certain information without disclosing too many details about the origin. And maybe in that area, again, with international standard, for example, from the ISO, there could be a way to find approaches and methodology that will, now, will enable the, those who are working on a day-to-day -day operation to share this information in a timely manner and to make use of them. Um, Larissa, if I may ask, could you repeat the first question? Um, is it a lack of willingness from um, any kind of other organization and kind of share information, or is it specific kind of like stakeholders? Mostly when, when it comes to states attributing yeah. cyber attacks to other states, mm -hmm. most of the time that happens without the sharing of the evidence that actually yes. led to that attribution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. I think, I think there, you know, there's, there's, I'm going to be very pragmatic here. I think there is a, a, a state prerogative, prerogative, right, of, um, of what kinds of information they can share. Uh, of course, when it comes to joint attribution, which we've seen increasingly in the past couple of years, I think there is, um, there is attempt, an attempt to prove that you know, uh, many states come together and that they're able to kind of verify that. Maybe that signals reassurance, but I definitely understand that there is some kind of um, challenge there in terms of uh, actual evidence, um, even though there's, there's sensitivities around that. On effective, uh, eff effectiveness of payments when it comes to ransomware, as I'd say that, you know, for example, the UK government has been quite you know, strict no payments. Um, I think there needs to be a balance in terms, I, I, I agree in many ways with saying, you know, not to finance these groups. I think it's a reasonable thing to say. But I think it is something that needs to be accompanied by government support, right? So if there's a policy coming at the national level that says it is not affecting, we, we recommend that you don't pay ransoms, you're basically saying if you don't have support to these kind of companies or organizations that they're they're just going to fail and that they don't have any support to kind of recover from that. And so I think there needs to be a proactiveness in supporting the recovery. Um, and, and that is something that governments should um, reflect. And I think also there is a growing cyber insurance market, which profits a lot from that. And that's growing uh, based on, on those kinds of policies. But I'd say that I think, you know, you cannot say, you know, don't pay ransom and not have support to the victims uh, in, irrespectively of the country that you're talking about. Um, I'd, I'd like to put you on the spot, Susan, actually, um, because one of the great things that we've seen over the last couple of weeks um, has been the sharing of the incidents by CERT Vanuatu, CERT Tonga, um, PNG CERT, and all, all the folks across the Pacific, which has been great. It hasn't, of course, reached the level of um, forensics, because it was, you know, presentations. Um, but I, in none of these cases were attribution made, at least in the, in the public forums. Um, and there was no evidence or no sharing that anyone had actually paid any ransoms. Um, so I just wanted to see if you had any thoughts on kind of the value of the attribution um, as well as, as kind of that ransomware question. Yes, so uh, thank you for your question. Um, yes, uh, when it comes to these types of, uh, of incidents, uh, I will again like to shine light on this uh, mutual trust. And, and that can be easily uh, captured uh, when you are from a region, uh, the same region. Huh? So uh, when this incident happens uh, uh, with platforms such as Paxon and First, uh, uh, we have uh, stakeholders uh, feel free to share information uh, more freely 
and that helps uh, when it comes to coming up with um, strategies going forward in addressing cyber incidents more effectively. And 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 I I, I would also like to highlight again. Uh, in this stage where we are heading into this uh, digital environment, the need of collaboration, strategic collaboration and cooperation amongst regional stakeholders is really, really important. The option of going solo is not an option anymore, and it's unfortunately not effective uh, in many ways. So, so yes. Uh, Kivuva, did you have any thoughts about some of the, the, the regional approaches that, that you guys were going through? Yeah, I think uh, probably for our local context, we, we have to work very closely with the regional bodies, especially like in Africa, we work with AU and AFRIPOL, uh, so that if there is any actor who is outside the country and wants to be apprehended, this, this different organization may be able to help but of course, you know, the world, politico, uh, the political system now is very fragmented. Uh, so there is East versus West. There is now Russia versus West. So even uh, if an actor or an, the adversary is on a state which you are not in good diplomatic terms with them, it becomes very hard to be able to collaborate and even uh, have them apprehended. That's why we see there are some countries within the world which are uh, notorious in producing or attacking, producing these, uh, these attacks like DDoS attacks, for example, or those phishing attacks or those spam, they are in some pockets of some countries that are not really collaborating with the international system of, of cybersecurity or international criminal system. So that is probably at a very higher level. Cool, thank you. Um. Hi, my name is Wilson. I am a youth de Brazil. Uh, my question is, how do how to establish cybersecurity policies based on the logic of the global south and the multi stakeholder when a large part of the debates on security still permeates bodies, genders, races, and the regions of specifics as the global north? And the IUO, do you have like to understand how the documents on the subject have proposed or not proposed to address each issues? Taking into account the net, the need to respect the security of countries, especially in the global south, and security of the minorities, includes cases of government hacking, such as Pegasus. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, uh, Wilson, for the for the question. I'm going to try to break it down in maybe two bits. Um, so, how to establish a policy based in the global south? Um, I think we need to think about policy making as different, let's say, concentric circles, right? And I think there is this discussion that we were having about the international level at the UN, right? And obviously, the objective over there is really to arrive at a consensus document and output, right? So you have all these member states coming together to kind of produce that. But I think, as I alluded to previously, there are other spaces at the regional level that really kind of provide that platform for thinking what does cybersecurity mean from that perspective. At the regional level, at the OAS, there are there's a confidence building measures working group uh, focusing on cyber that has been there since 2016, right? And I think there's lots of layers to that. You know, countries when they gather, and I and you know that applies to the African Union. It applies, you know, to to ASEAN. It's really about developing trust at the regional level so that you can arrive at a stage where states can come together and say, yes, we agree on these things, and the CBM's working group over at the OAS, you know, they have established, you know, we need points of contact throughout the region. And all of that layers up into 
thinking about and creating a vision over there. And if you think the OAS, for example, like in 20, don't quote me on that, <laughs> uh, in 2012, if I'm not mistaken, or even before that, they published like a, resolu like a resolution on you know, cyberspace within the Americas, like hemispheric security. Um, so I think, you know, and the UN was also publishing a resolution on that a couple of years before. Um, so you see these concentric circles, you see the debate progressing, so I think there's space for that. But even at the UN, part of the resolution, the, the um, apologies, part of the, um, the final, let's say, report of these conversations at the open-ended working group, they have recognized the importance of thinking about capacity building as something that's south-south, north-south, and triangular. So that is a language from the developing kind of development discussions that has been incorporated. And I think there's a huge agenda for research and, and thinking of like what South-South cooperation means within the first committee, within the context of, let's say, capacity building throughout the region. And I think we're getting there. And there's like, uh, maybe maybe my colleagues can talk more about that. There is the conference, the global, com um, the global cyber capacity building conference that's going to happen. And I think it's a platform for thinking about, let's say, how to progress a South-South vision on, on that point. Very briefly, what I will add to what Louise just mentioned, and definitely I agree, a very good model to exemplify the concentric circles, is, as I was talking before about the risk approach. If in the risk approach there are, and there is an appreciation and consideration for risk that address exactly those issues that you were alluding to, I think then the result and the outcome of the analysis will be in line, will include an evaluation and a consideration of aspect of representation. So it's all about having those criteria being as comprehensive as possible at the beginning of the process. So I think very humbly, this report that we are discussing today is probably an excellent example of uh, that kind of approach. Because after the 2021 work that has been done on the norms, this report aimed at looking at the impact of the cybersecurity event on the citizen across the globe and the feedback the result of that analysis evaluation that in turn can inform and can improve in a continuous improvement approach the definition of the criteria that are considered for the analysis of risk. So on the issue of Pegasus, if, if Ed, Edward Snowden is still in exile, you, you see that countries which are more powerful will be are able to push their agenda. Um, and weaker countries, there's nothing we can do. So these are issues maybe that can be discussed at the Security Council, as you had addressed before, because these are advanced states. Uh, they have all the financial, military, mass, or power. Uh, so this, the, that discussion still actually sits at probably at the UN Security Council, and that's why Edward, Edward Snowden is still in exile uh, after revealing all the information that he revealed or the truth that he did, yeah. Can I just add a quick quick point to that on the on the Pegasus and, and commercial hacking tools. I think we need to think about, you know, how developing countries develop their own cyber capabilities. Uh, of course, there's the whole, like, concentric circles, regional coordination, you know, but I think there is another layer, which is, you know, for countries that are not the ones developing technology, most of those technologies, I mean, how do they develop the capability to investigate, which, you know, in terms of law enforcement, there's certain accountabilities, but how do we think about the responsibility or the values and principles involved in thinking about the c capability development when it comes to cyber operations or even to, let's say, other types of activities that, that states conduct in cyberspace. So I think there, there, that is something to consider because it's a bit of a paradox there that, that needs to be further reflected. How do countries, especially developing countries, acquire capabilities and make sure that they are not you know, doing that in an unaccountable or irresponsible way? Thanks, guys. 
Um, in the interest of time, we'll take both of your questions together, if that's all right, and the, the panel can, can answer them, um, if you want to ask yours. Yeah, thank you very much. My name is Honorable Mishimboko uh, from Kenya, and also a commissioner representing uh, information and communication for the parliament. I'm happy that we have our Kenyan representative here, and I would also request you that in terms of involving the stakeholders, you need to incorporate members of parliament because that is where we legislate some laws and it's where we formulate some policies. So it is prudent that you also involve us in your processes. My question is, I come from a country where we have been attacked many times by the terrorist gangs known as Al-Shabaab. The major one being the 7th August 1998 bomb blast. So for now, we are really anticipating that maybe there might be cyber terrorism. So I'm just asking whether as an international platform, whether you have some strategies or measures you are putting in place to ensure that we are going to counter this kind of a process that cyber terrorism. Because right now, they're just trying in a, in a small scale, infiltrating our military bases and maybe our computer system. But who knows, maybe, Sometimes, maybe later or in future, they might use this so that to create more havoc to our country or rather in the globe. So my question is, are we prepared or what are we doing to ensure that this one will not be a big threat to the world? I thank you. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Uh, good morning, uh, dear panelists. My name is Elaine Liu and I come from Singapore. I'm an independent participant uh, at this IGF forum. So first of all, I really like the use case that shared on Kenya. Uh, coincidentally, I'm talking about Kenya, and I like the word stick, which is stop, think, and you check. So let me bring down a couple of layers down on what I'm trying to say here. As citizen of this global world, when we have cyber best practices, sometimes it's at the top level or organizational. But at the citizen's level, that's what best practices need to be in place as well, and that's lacking. There's excessive data collection with a retail store. You get cheated when you apply your jobs, and today the cyber crimes and fraud are no longer localized, but regionalized and internationalized. So my question is really, is there any way we could think about and enforce and police check how we collect data? Because when we shop or we apply jobs, we tend to supply a lot of data, and data is the first entry to a lot of these systems and cyber or crime or fraud. So data collection. And number two is about penalty. It's about calling the bad guys and making it so obvious to the citizens because there's a part to play by citizen at the cybersecurity practices. So that's what I'm sharing. My background in cybersecurity and data protection, but I also get the fear of being cheated. So the question is, how do you stop, think, and the check? What do that each citizen need to do? Thank you very much. Thank you. Cool. It, very, very quickly. 15 seconds. Uh, so I'm Vineet. I'm the global president for Cyber Peace for the Records. Uh, well, I'd like to just share, and basically a quick question for the panel is, there are a lot of tech-based abuse that's happening, cyber-enabled trafficking, CSAM, and other issues happening. Uh, while there are issues, there are also challenges that we see on the ground that we are duplicating efforts. So how do we kind of ensure sustainability and impact rather than duplicating so that the resources that we create, we kind of share it with the other stakeholders, partners to avoid duplication and focus more on sustainability and the impact. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it, by way of a closing statement, I, I hope each of our panelists can choose one of the three questions or touch on all three, um, maybe one minute each. We'll start from Susan and work our way back. Thank you so much. Uh, I'd like to start on the last question uh, in um, how do we uh, make sure we do not duplicate effort. Um, just the last week, we have the Pacific Hub, the GFCE, the Global Forum on Cyber Expertise Pacific Hub launch, and this is one of the platforms that is uh, in place to address all these issues of trying our best to make sure we utilize our resources more effectively and, and efficiently and not duplicating the, the, the efforts. And this is a, also, we ha having the GFC is having also the Chisitribi 
uh, another event that we'll be having uh, in uh, Ghana, and, and that's also uh, trying to find this um, capacity, cyber capacity building gaps, but at the same time focusing on making use of our resources uh, on the best uh, productive uh, level as we can. And yes, uh, I think that's, uh, thank you so much. Okay, so I want to thank uh, my member of parliament, Honorable Mission Boko for inviting us to collaborate with them. Actually, uh, before the, the, there is a new parliament in Kenya because elections were done last year. So in the last parliament, we used to collaborate uh, very much. We used to have round tables with the, with the committee on, uh, committee on IT, so chaired by Honorable Kisang and also in Senate chaired by Honorable Gideon Moy. So, we take that invitation and we we'll look for you so that we can actually form a new collaboration going forward. Uh, of course, on what she's talking about uh, cyber terrorism, there is, a, there is a challenge in Kenya. And especially in the parts of northern Kenya, uh, you find critical infrastructure, especially telecommunication masts. Uh, they are usually targeted by terrorists because that part borders Somalia. Uh, so it's an easy hit, and of course, uh, I think they have a security committee in parliament. Probably there is a way they will be able to handle that, but we've been getting international support from uh, the, the countries that Kenya is collaborating with to try and handle the terrorism part. And that also uh, is uh, also on cyber, or cyber terrorism, there is also international support. On probably on data, data collection, uh, there is principles on, of data minimization, and I know GDPR probably addresses that. And also, you ca we, countries can have local internalized laws, like Kenya has a data protection law and a data protection commissioner, and they usually enforce uh, collection, and there is usually penalties. Like last week, uh, the, there was like around $100,000 worth of penalties that were issued to organizations that were breaching data of citizens. Excellent, thank you. Awesome to see that practical outcome of the session as well. Thank you. Uh, I will try to address very briefly the, the question, the comments on the data collection. Uh, this is for me a, a very uh, near and dear uh, area because in the last seven years, most of my time has been uh, invested in designing and implementing a digital identity solution for the United Nations Pension Fund for the 84,000 Rate is a beneficiary around the world that receive periodic payments from the United Nations. And before we collect, it means that we're sharing. And I think we can all agree that nowadays, in interacting with the online services, we are oversharing a lot of information that theoretically will not be needed. I mean, the reference also to data minimization. So I think that, that there is hope that new models a new technology such as self-sovereign identity and selective disclosure can lead to a situation where we are no longer required to oversharing and therefore to reduce that amount of data that inevitably then gets mined and gets collected. Thank you. Very quickly, um, three three points to stick to my my three points as as a as a standard um, on the impact sustainability question. Um, first is definitely information sharing. I think there there are public platforms for thinking about you know initiatives that are trying to do the same thing. Uh, but then you know I think the Sybil portal from uh, the GFC is a very interesting example of how the public information can really help across like both governmental and non-governmental organizations to know what other um, other other parts of the world and other let's say organizations are doing in terms of capacity building um, I think there is one of the things that also came out of the discussion that we had over at the OAWG is being able to monitor activities so when it comes to like crisis response you know some of the projects are public um, some are, are made public in the sense of you know countries sometimes say that they're supporting country X or a country that's being supported says that. So I think there's a lot of cataloging that we need to do, and I say that as a research community, uh, in terms of tracking those different types of, of assistance. And finally, um, in it, 
I think there is an evolving landscape of en enhancing mechanisms, so it's not just about having an MOU anymore. It's maybe thinking about procurement, something that came out of, uh, and uh, how to enhance procurement in certain instances, and that came out also of our discussion um, at the OWG, is some countries don't necessarily just want skills building, they also want technology. So how do you ensure that when you actually have technology coming in, that you don't have a short-term licensing agreement, that you actually build you know, the, the technology and embed it for a longer period of time? So these are my three points. And I'd just like to thank the BPF for the wonderful work that they have been doing. Yes, let me echo the thank you to all the contributors to the BPF, um, to everyone who's asked the questions, and of course, to the panelists for such an engaging conversation. Um, thank you guys so much for sharing your insights, um, and thank you to everyone.